Hello, I'm Thomas Dinas, the host of the Delicious Legacy podcast. This episode is another one from the archives, and it's all about a brief history of ancient Mesopotamian food. I'll be back again next week with new episode, a two-part about the history of Irish food with an exciting expert, and then in the following weeks, I will have some episodes about foods of the Aztecs, foods of the Ottoman Empire, foods of the Persian Sassanids, and Athena's Dipnos of Isteb. So, yeah, there are some exciting episodes coming up, and they're all in some production stage or another. So, stay tuned, and I'll be with you very soon with more exciting archaeogastronomical content. Take care. Given birth by the flowing water, tenderly cared for by Ninhuraja. Ninkasi, given birth by the flowing water, having founded your town upon wax, she completed its great walls for you. Ninkasi, having founded your town upon wax, she completed its great walls for you. Your father is Enki, the lord Nudimud, and your mother is Ninti, the queen of Abzu. Ninkasi, your father is Enki, the lord Nudimud, and your mother is Ninti, the queen of the Abzu. Ninkasi, it is you who handle and tow with a big shovel, mixing in a pit the beer bread and sweet aromatics. Ninkasi, it is you who bake the beer bread in the big oven and put in order the piles of hulled grain. Ninkasi, it is you who water the earth cover malt. The noble dogs guard it, even from the monarchs. Ninkasi, it is you who soak the malt in a jar. The waves rise, the waves fall. Ninkasi, it is you who spread the cooked mash on large reed mats. Coolness overcomes. Ninkasi, it is you who hold with both hands the great sweet wort, brewing it with honey and wine. Ninkasi, the sweet wort, you, the sweet wort to the vessel. Ninkasi, you place the fermenting vat, which makes a pleasant sound, appropriately on top of a large collector vat. Ninkasi, it is you who pour out the filtered beer of the collector vat. It is like the onrush of the Tigris and Euphrates. This is the hymn to Ninkasi. This beautiful document dates from 1800 BCE and clearly describes the brewing process in its many phases while singing the praises of Ninkasi, the ancient Sumerian goddess of brewing. It is intriguing that every part of the process has its counterpart in the modern process of beer making. So many of the details ring familiar to a practical brewer's ear. This document was found by archaeologists in the modern region of Iraq, or ancient Mesopotamia, which was a patchwork of different civilizations and people and tribes which uh, lived for uh, millennia, from about 6000 BCE, in the region which we call Mesopotamia, between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates in the modern day Iraq and Syria. Welcome to another episode of the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Today we're going to talk about the food of the ancient Mesopotamian civilizations. And that um, basically will cover a relatively big region of the Middle East. And of course uh, it will span thousands and thousands of years um, into the past. And it will cover different civilizations and peoples who lived in that region. When we talk about Mesopotamia which is um, um, an ancient Greek word for the region of modern-day Iraq and uh, Syria and uh, southeast Turkey. Um, we're talking about um, the land between the two rivers, and that means Mesopotamia, between the rivers. 
and the rivers being Tigris and Euphrates. This land was um, it was the cradle of civilization. That's where the first big cities were um, founded. And there was a patchwork of different civilizations, uh, such as the Sumerians, later Assyrians, Akkadians, Babylonians, and so on and so forth. So on, on our episode today, we're going to try and cover um, food from a region with many different civilizations and a region steeped into history with thousands upon thousands of years of um, history that we can cover and we can learn from. The Sumerian civilization flourished in a region that is generally considered very poor on natural resources. There is virtually no stone and no trees, but there is abundant clay and silt. And this, for the early ancient Sumerians, was uh, enough. They found a way to use it as their main technology. They learned how to take the clay in the ground and make it into pots to store food and drinks. Indeed, they invented the pottery wheel. They used clay to build houses. With abundant reed in the rivers and marshes, they used them as building material for houses and dams and, of course, as styluses. Thank God for the invention of riding. They also invented the plough. The Sumerian civilization is thousands and thousands of years old. First people arrived in the area in the Fertile Crescent um, about 6000 BC, so about 8000 years ago. And from there they started to spread and they worked their way down the rivers of Tigris and Euphrates, where they created the first cities of mankind. And thankfully, with all the technological innovation of um, canal building and the engineering and mathematics skills alongside with um, the um, growing bureaucracy to accommodate more people and um, store all this um, food and distribute it and so on. Thankfully, with all this bureaucracy, they invented um, writing, which is not only very important for mankind, but uh, very important for... <laughs> For, uh, for us right now, so we can study and understand what, uh, what these people thought, how they thought, and uh, what actual um, everyday worries and contracts they had, and of course, what foods uh, they ate. And of course, in these records, uh, we found out also some uh, recipes. So yeah, firstly, I want to, to impress how important it is that they had uh, they invented writing. One of the things that the Sumerians did uh, it was to invent writing. Um, and um, this first writing, it is called cuneiform. As, um, as it's obvious, cuneiform is a kind of writing and not a language. Uh, so basically cuneiform is used to write Sumerian or Akkadian or Babylonian and so on. And it traces its roots back to the momentous episode for the world around 3200 BCE. So we're talking about more than 5,000 years ago, maybe around five and a half thousand years ago, when uh, someone came up with the idea of writing. Uh, at that moment, prehistory stopped. History began. Cuneiform was invented in Uruk, which is in modern day Iraq, uh, the southern part of Iraq, and was initially and mainly used as a bookkeeping tool. But luckily, um, over the centuries and over the thousands of years that, they, that elapsed, more and more information was um, stored in these uh, tablets. And uh, we have, um, thankfully, we have a lot of uh, details about um, what, um, what food items um, the king required, what did the priest, uh, priests, uh, the messengers, uh, soldiers, uh, what was exchanged between different um, traders and bankers, and also what uh, was um, trading between different regions of the Sumerian loose empire, let's say. Each cuneiform tablet is a time capsule from our point of view. And luckily, many, many survived as they were made of clay and um, they were buried under the temples and the palaces. And of course, a lot of kings had also libraries full of uh, cuneiform tablets, clay cuneiform tablets. And um, they survived because 
When this place is destroyed in uh, fires and uh, wars and so on, and destructions, the clay hardened and, of course, the text within it survived. And all these uh, tablets were found by archaeologists buried. The people of the region, as I said, dug canals, and they realized they could grow crops not near the river, but far away from it, as far as they can dig canals. And they became very good at it. That's growing food, wheat and barley. So these first farmers um, started to spread and worked their way down the rivers of Euphrates and Tigris. Aside from uh, growing wheat and barley, they've noticed that uh, date palms grow in the region, which can nourish them and also they can be cultivated. And of course, under these um, date palms, under the shade, other, more sensitive plants can grow. In gardens, they cultivated pomegranates, grapes, figs, leeks, cucumbers and garlic. They had beer. It was called the noble liquor. In fact, we know that they had at least 13 different varieties brewed directly from the fields of wheat and barley. Mesopotamia is the region that uh, the first beer was made and it was a very different um, kind of um, um, beverage back then. A more, um, it wasn't that clear liquid that we know of now. It was more like a very thin porridge. So to drink it, you needed straws and it was uh, drunk in huge vessels, in huge communal v vessels, many people from the same pot drinking with straws. To the modern brewer, the most interesting aspect of these ancient beers is that they were made from bread. As the hymn uh, we heard earlier on makes it clear, the loaves of bread, which are called bapir, were mixed with malted barley to form a mash. And thus, just in some modern breweries, the natural enzymes in the malt would convert other starch sources into sugar, forming a complex, sweet, unfermented wort. Sumerian scholars have discovered that this bread was not only used in brewing, but was also stored in government warehouses on the national highway system. From what we know from texts and uh, from traditions from the region and also from uh, um, the understanding of archaeologists, this um, bread, this bapir bread, uh, had to have been uh, very dry and it would keep indefinitely. Baking experiments with barley and advice from several sources led to the conclusion that this bread uh, would have been twice baked. It is thought that bapir was seldom baked with the intent of being eaten. Its storage qualities made it a good candidate for an emergency ration in times of scarcity, but its primary use seems to have been uh, beer making. A few years ago, an unexpected discovery has been made and one that shook things a bit for us ancient food enthusiasts. From the dusty drawers of the brilliant Babylonian collection at Yale University, three cuneiform tablets were exhumed. These tablets, dating from around 1600 BCE, contain about 40 recipes, enough to gain some knowledge at last of the secrets of Mesopotamian cuisine. Many centuries, more than a millennia before, than our venerated hero Archestratus. The Yale culinary tablets provide instructions for more than two dozen Mesopotamian dishes. Among them, stews of pigeon, lamb, or turnip dish, and a kind of a poultry pie. Written on the best preserved of the tablets are 25 recipes, 21 for meat and 4 for vegetables. Instructions call for the most of the food to be prepared with water and fats and to simmer for a long time in a covered pot. Most are for meat stews, which suggests that the recipes were designed for the upper classes, as this would be normally the people who could afford meat. According to Jean Botero, a French Assyriologist, the tablets revealed a cuisine of striking richness, refinement, sophistication and artistry, which is surprising from such an early period. Jean Baudero also wrote, They seem obsessed with every member of the onion family, and in contrast to our tastes, 
salt played a rather minor role in their diet. Meats included gazelle, stag, kid, lamb, mutton, squab, and a bird called taru. Frequently mentioned seasonings included onion, garlic, leeks, and uh, stews were often thickened with grains, milk, beer, or animal blood. Two of the main seasonings, called samidu and suhutinu, have not been identified. Most scholars think they're probably part of the onion family. Mesopotamian spices included kamunu, cumin, kisiburu, coriander, ninu, mint, salahu, which is some cress, samaskilu, which is fennel possibly, shambalitu, fenugreek, kaamatu, uh, sumac, surmenu, juniper berries, kasu, wild licorice, and the roots of, uh, of this probably used to flavor soups and stews with uh, their sweet anise-like flavor. They also had uh, something called um, uh, siburatu, which is mustard most likely, or it could be roux, and um, something called ukush hab, which uh, in the amount specified, which are usually very small, refers probably to minced zest of citron. Other explanations that make little culinary sense is that this uh, refers to cucumber or something similar. Ingredients um, include andahaksu, which is a wild tulip bulb. Uh, there are multiple references to this uh, spring root vegetable. Some statements and comments in the north uh, Mesopotamia. We don't know which uh, species of tulip that refers to, but there are many that are edible and they have a distinct mildly bitter flavor. There's also a possibility that this could refer to a wild crocus or lily bulb. Halazu, which is carob seeds, seems to be another popular ingredient used either as um, either carob seeds or it could be uh, also carob syrup or carob powder. Carob is widely enjoyed across Western Asia, the Levant and the Eastern Mediterranean today and imparts a sweet chocolate-like flavor to dishes. Ancient Sumerians ate um, meat such as um, sheep and uh, ewes and goats, which we see on texts that they record um, sheep being sent to kitchens on behalf of the troops, or uh, ten full-grown goats sent to the kitchen on the behalf of the warriors in the Tumal region. Uh, mutton, pork, fowl and fish were included in the provisions for the king's household, and this is found in multiple texts. Rather surprisingly, uh, we seem to find that meat was also supplied for the prisoners of war. There is a reference for salted and preserved meat. There is uh, something translated as pickled mutton, which was used in a ritual. Bones from sheep, goat, cattle and pigs were found in uh, Tel Amarand, and uh, it was estimated that the bones represent about 14 to 16 individual pigs, 6 sheep and goats, and 415 cattle. Fish-wise, the bulk of the evidence for fish in the diet comes from the 3rd millennium BC, when large quantities of fish are recorded. There may have been an element of overfishing, which caused the numbers of fish available to drop, making the role of fish as food source less important during the 2nd millennium. Neo-Assyrian reliefs depict the rivers and canals being full of different sorts of fish, which suggests that the fish population may have become plentiful again, but although the texts show the taxes and tribute are being paid in fish, the number recorded are not quite as large as those in the third millennium. Another important ingredient was sour milk, which was included in offerings at the early dynastic legas. Also included in issues are two dishes in which milk formed a major part. These are zliga, a porridge of emmer wheat and milk, and a gruel-like mixture of flour and milk. It is possible that this was similar to the modern Iraqi milk wheat product called kushuk, which is made by mixing dried parboiled wheat grits with yogurt and fermenting it about a week. Kushuk can be sun-dried and ground into powder for storing. 
It is then reconstituted with water or milk when required for use. Very popular fat for uh, cooking was uh, sheep's tail fat, rendered sheep's tail fat in, in fact, which uh, is still considered a delicacy and it was uh, an indispensable ingredient in Iraq until about 1960s. Tuhu is another Mesopotamian meal which uh, uses red beetroots and shares similarities with both the brost pre prevalent in Ashkenazi cuisine as well as a stew prevalent amongst Iraqi Jews called kofta shawandar hamdu, meatballs with sweet and sour beetroots. Likewise, there is a lamb stew, uh, which calls uh, for meat sauteed in sheep tails fat. A close cousin to the stew might be the Iraqi pasha, a dish uh, which uh, is prepared by cooking all the parts of the sheep, and um, the sheep carcass is, uh, is prepared in similar ways as to the ones described in the tablets. Three of the world's oldest known recipes, recorded 3,700 years ago by an Akkadian scribe, were translated, and I'm going to give you the instructions shortly. These were very brief recipes, shall we say, uh, not mentioning much in terms of quantities. In fact, quantities weren't mentioned at all. Uh, and also the ingredients, it was more like a list of ingredients and with very simplified or abbreviated um, cooking instructions. A lot of them, of the words I'm going to use now, it's um, basically elaborations that have been added from the translators to enhance the meaning of the original recipes. For kids too. Since head legs and tail over flame, before putting in pot. Meat, in addition to kid, is needed, preferably mutton, to sharpen the flavor. Bring water to boil. Throw in fat. Squeeze onion, samidu, which is another plant probably of the onion family, and garlic, to extract juices and add to pot with blood and sour milk. Add an equal amount of raw suhutinu, which is another plant probably of the onion family, and serve. Taru bird stew. As I mentioned earlier, taru is a bird that we don't know which exactly, what is, what is translated exactly. So go with a, with a suggestion that might be a pigeon or quail or a partridge. So the recipe goes like this. Besides the taru birds, Meat from a fresh leg of mutton is needed. Boil the water, throw fat in, dress the taru and place in pot. Add coarse salt as needed. Add hulled cake of malt. Squeeze onions, samidu, leek, garlic and add to pot along with milk. After cooking and cutting up the taru, plant them to braise in stock from the pot. Then place them back in pot in order to finish cooking. Then must be brought out for carving. Braised turnips. Meat is not needed. Boil water. Throw fat in. Add onion, an unknown plant known for used as seasoning, which we cannot decipher which one. Coriander, cumin, and kanashu, which is a legume. Squeeze leek and garlic and spread juice on this. Add onion and mint. For a meat pie, baked in in an unleavened crust, we have the following instructions. Carefully lay out the fowls on a platter. Spread over them the chopped pieces of gizzard and plaque, as well as the small sepetu breads which have been baked in the oven. Sprinkle the whole with sauce, cover with a prepared crust and send to the table. Stirred into the dough were various condiments and aromatic ingredients that enhance the taste. The pie's filling was composed of small fowls, we don't know whether these were wild or domestic fowl, and cooked in a spicy sauce with their own gizzards and plaque. The result must have been like a gravy, a giblet gravy. And when the dish was served, it was garnished with small flat bread loaves that were also flavoured, not too different from the bread stuffing we eat a chicken today. Mesopotamian style fowl. Ingredients from the tablet. Pigeon, salt, 
water, fat, vinegar, semolina, leek, garlic, shallots, tulip bulb, yogurt or sour cream, and greens. As with all Mesopotamian recipes, how these are put together and in what quantities is up to you. So for vinegar, we can use some pomegranate vinegar. Um, so we'll clean and dry the fowl and salt liberally inside and out. We put aside. Prepare water, stock and vinegar in a large stock pot, uh, large enough to, to hold um, the beds too. Prepare water, stock and vinegar in a large stock pot. Add butter, asafoetida, mint and rocket and heat over high flame, stirring occasionally. When the water has come to a boil, add the birds and return to boil. Reduce heat a bit and cook uncovered over medium heat for 5 minutes. Then reduce heat to liquid, just bubbles. Cover and cook for 5 minutes. In a food processor, pulls together the onions, leek and 6-7 to seven cloves of garlic and some uh, yogurt. Add it to the water in the chickens and continue to cook for another 10 minutes. Don't overcook. Total cooking time for the birds in the pot is 15 to 20 minutes. When done, remove birds from the pot and set aside until cool enough to handle. Preheat the oven to high. While cooling the birds, take the stock you use to cook the hens and pour it into a clean saucepan. If you are using a cup or two of stock, to make couscous, barley or some other grain, do it now and pour off about one third to one half of the stock that remains. Heat to a steady low boil, stirring constantly and cook uncovered to reduce. Pulse the mint and sage with the remaining garlic in the food processor a few times until nicely mixed and add a teaspoon or two of so of water to moisten them. What type of meals did the people of Mesopotamia prefer or think right? Remains of food dishes were found on saucers as part of a foundation offering on the mid-third millennium Ur, Ur being a city in the ancient Sumerian region. Here the bones of sheep or goat, uh, date stones, rings of dried apples and the remains of possible flatbread suggest that a mixed diet of meat, fruit and bread was favoured. The rations issued to messengers in that period usually included beer, bread, onions and oil, with the occasional addition of fish. The king's meals saw a wide variety of cereal and vegetable-based dishes, with fruits and honey, oils and fish and meat. In accounts listing food given for a marriage ceremony in the old Babylonian period, sheep, bread and beer together with ghee and lines in oil were issued to the groom, his mother and other members of the wedding party. At Nimrud, in the first millennium, what may be remains of a cooked meal included possibly cracked barley, dried grapes and green vegetables. Texts from the same period and the list of provisions for Ashurbanipal's feast show that a wide variety of foodstuffs were favoured and that both cereal and vegetable dishes and meat were used. A text from the Neo-Babylonian period gives what may be a recipe and throws some light on the tastes of the people of the time. The recipe records uh, boiling plenty of roasted spices, including mustard, cress, cumin in uh, licorice water, with, an addi- with the addition of cucumber, and then this is cooked until uh, it's reduced to a half. This is then strained and stuffed into freshly slaughtered meat. This suggests uh, that highly spiced dishes were uh, eaten and possibly that dishes of meat stuffed with vegetables were prepared. Of course, these offerings in the royal graves and the marriage ceremony and the king's meals and Ashurbanipal's feast um, represent special occasions. It is the messenger's rations and the meal found at Nimrud which may give a better idea of everyday food. Alongside with some proverbs that might help One ancient Sumerian proverb says Barley flour in the fields is meat and fat. So freely interpreted, this means that um, barley flour can taste as good as meat and fat. Another one says you are pouring off the fat from meat. 
you're mashing the roasted barley. Freely interpreted, the fat should be left with the meat and the roasted barley should be eaten whole. A third proverb refers to the food of the mother of the heroes. Being drenched in fat and even if her food was drenched in honey and ghee, this would not console her for her sons. All this suggests that fatty meat was considered the best and the fat and oils were a sought after part of the diet and they may therefore have been rare. Mesopotamian dishes appear in records of food rituals and upon archaeological artifacts. Mesopotamians not only fed themselves but also assembled elaborate dishes for the gods. Sweets, which made their way into popular traditions and rituals, incorporated honey and date fruits. Mesopotamian pastry chefs crafted recipes for kulupu, a sweet date-filled cookie, and mersu, a dated pistachio candy. Ancient texts reveal the ancient Mesopotamians offered uh, the kulupu to Sumerian goddess Inanna during the New Year and Spring festivals. From um, ancient Mesopotamian um, um, medical texts, we also have a remedy for hangover, which goes like this. Remedy for hangover. If a man has taken strong wine and his head is affected and he forgets his words and his speech becomes confused and his mind wanders and his eyes have a set expression, to cure him, take licorice, beans, oleander and compound them with oil and wine before the approach of the goddess Gula and in the morning before sunrise and before anyone has kissed him, let him take it and he will recover. We also have a recipe for a remedy for um, overeating. If a man eats and drinks to his fill and then his stomach cuts him and his insides are affected and swell up and has a colic, he is suffering from mushekinu. To cure him, take cedar bark, juniper bark, sweet reed, myrtle and oleander. Chop up these substances, add wine, heat the mixture, pour it off, add honey and refined oil. Let it cool, rub it on his stomach and pour it on his anus. Babylonian and Assyrian medicine never cut loose from uh, its close association with uh, incantations and magic. So combined with incantations and uh, certain ceremonies that were enacted uh, in order to relieve the patient from the grasp of the demons, these rites led to the actual introduction of medical remedies by the side of what we may call direct sympathetic magic, such as the tying of knots in a cord or placing a little boat made of some material on the waters to symbolize the expected departure of the demon. We have a well-known text of a variety of indirect methods such as the peeling of an onion and throwing one peel after the other to the fire to the accompaniment of a formula emphasizing the hope that as one peel after the other is consumed in the fire and the onion will never take root or blossom again so the demon might never reappear. Following the symbolical act of the onion, the text proceeds to the enumeration of other materials, such as dates, palm blossoms, bits of sheep and goat skins, wool, and certain kinds of seed, which are similarly thrown to the fire to the accompaniment of appropriate formula, all expressive of the same hope as in the case of the onion. Now these objects are not chosen at haphazard. They represent the materials introduced into the medical texts, either directly as a healing remedies, such as onions, dates, palm blossoms and seeds, or they occur as accessories in medical treatment, such as bits of skin on which poultices and ointments were spread. Similarly, in ritual texts detailing the ceremonies to be performed by the exorciser, a large number of actual medical compounds are introduced, consisting of such substances as milk, butter, honey, wine, oil, meat, salt, dates, flour and various trees, plants, herbs and stones, 
which enter as ingredients in the direct treatment of disease. Obviously, through experience, it was found that these certain common diseases, such as indigestion, diarrhea, constipation, colds, headaches, and fevers, certain articles of food and certain herbs uh, can be beneficial. So primitive logic concluded uh, that uh, what was good for a man must be bad for the demon. And accordingly, the remedies were attached to these incantations as helpful accessories to the powerful formula and symbolically introduced into the ritual accompanying the direct medical treatment of disease. So what we see is that um, food and certain food ingredients um, played an important role in the medicinal um, cures of uh, the Mesopotamian people. And this is uh, kind of obvious since uh, through experience they found that certain common diseases were cured by certain articles of food and certain herbs and plants. So the, the early doctors and uh, priests and magicians concluded that what was good for man must be bad for the demon. So accordingly, these uh, remedies were uh, adjusted to exercise the demons, alongside, of course, with the, with the direct medical treatment of the disease. All in all, we can say that uh, we, have, we have quite sophisticated cuisine from the ancient Mesopotamia, and um, we have quite a few evidence that um, culinary traditions have survived to modern-day Iraq, or at least almost to the modern day, which is always uh, nice. Of course, certain things like uh, animal blood uh, used in um, soups and stews in, from, from the ancient Sumerians is obviously prohibited now. Uh, but uh, other than that, the main element seems seem to be very familiar and similar to the peoples throughout this stretch of uh, thousands and thousands of years. The written records that we have, if you think about it, uh, from 3200 BCE, it means we're talking about uh, this was 5,000, 5,500 years ago, which is uh, scary, really, how far... <laughs> how far into the past we have uh, information about. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this podcast and learned something new about uh, the ancient Mesopotamians and their culinary adventures. As we've seen, the food, medicine, ritual, the gods and the kings were all closely intertwined and the same foods that they were essential for sustenance they were also part of um, ritual offerings to the gods and medicine to heal people and also precious and prized items for the kings and their feasts. It's really difficult to condense the um, history of um, four or five thousand years and different civilizations and peoples who all lived around the Fertile Crescent to one single episode about Mesopotamia. But I think what we're trying to do here is uh, lightly touch some very basic subjects and obviously check some food ingredients, what vegetables they had, what meat they ate. And through the records, through the clay tablet records from, that have been translated by archaeologists and Assyriologists through the last 150 years, we're lucky to have an insight on the way they, these people thought, these ancient people thought, and of course found out over the years bit about their religion, bit about their medicines, about the fears and about the loves and so on. And of course we have not accurate information, but a lot of knowledge uh, about the diet. And this comes only, not only from reading the tablets, but also experimental archaeology and um, what um, scientific analysis of remains of, uh, of uh, the jugs and pottery that has been that has been found over the years the analysis of the of the remains has um, enlightened us with uh, more information about uh, the diets of the peoples back then of course the very interesting thing is um these few tablets from yale that have been found and translated uh, recently uh, relatively recently anyway they contain in a sense uh, recipes um, sumerian recipes for um, for my patreon backers i will um, I will upload some um, modern takes on the ancient recipes with uh, precise ingredients and instructions on how to recreate them. 
I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, take care and please um, become a patron on Patreon uh, to support me and also to get um, a lot of extra, extra writing and um, recipes and um, knowledge about ancient foods. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Goodbye.